Last week, as we continued our journey through the book of Acts, uh, we started to focus on the threats that the early church in Jerusalem was facing. Uh, Last week, we heard about a threat that was outside of the church, namely the Jewish religious leaders, uh, who were calling upon uh, the apostles, the leaders of the church, not to speak in the name of Jesus Christ. Indeed, uh, some of the uh, Jewish religious leaders wanted to put the apostles to death. Uh, The apostles spent time in jail. Uh, Indeed, they were flogged. Uh, But despite this opposition, what happened? The Christians prayed that God would enable them to keep on speaking the truth of the gospel boldly, and that's exactly what they did. And the word of God continued to spread despite that opposition from the Jewish religious leaders. Now today, uh, as we look at Acts 5 and 6, our focus is not on opposition outside of the church or threats from outside of the church, but threats from within it. Now, that might surprise you uh, to hear that there were threats from within uh, the early church in Jerusalem. Indeed, over the last few weeks, I've been speaking about how uh, this church was actually a really good church. Indeed, an example of an ideal church, the most ideal example of church that you find in the New Testament, because we've heard that these people were one in heart and mind. We've heard that they were generous and uh, no one was in need as a result. We heard their behaviour was so good that even those outside of the church held them in high regard and such was their behaviour and the apostles preaching that more and more people were actually becoming members of the church, becoming followers of Jesus. And you might think, how could a church like that have threats from within? Well, friends, it wasn't a perfect church because the people who make up the church were not perfect. And indeed, even us today who make up the church are not perfect. Uh, All of us are imperfect. All of us are flawed because we're all sinful. Uh, Friends, um, the truth of the matter is it's because of our imperfection, it's because of our being flawed, it's because of our sinfulness that Jesus needed to come into the world and die in our place so we can actually be right with God. Because by rights, we don't deserve to be right with God. We don't deserve his blessing. Uh, The church was imperfect. And we start to see some of the imperfections emerging, some of the flaws emerging in these two passages. There are two main threats that we see emerge in these two passages. One is the threat of deception and the other is the threat of division. The threat of deception and the threat of division. And what we're going to uh, do now is we're going to uh, look at both passages that were read. We're going to focus on uh, why these threats came about. We're going to focus on how they were dealt with decisively by God and by his apostles. And then we're going to see how it was because of this decisive action that was taken that the gospel continued to spread. So that's where we're focused today. Now, The big lesson, I think, that emerges for us from these passages is that when threats do emerge in the life of our church, whether it's deception or division or something else, we must deal with such threats decisively uh, to make sure that the unity of our church is preserved and to make sure that we continue to be effective in the mission that God, that the Lord Jesus has given to us. But let's come to the first of the threats the threat of division. And this brings me to my first point, which is that God acted decisively when deception arose in the early church. Now, the two people who were responsible for introducing this threat uh, into the life of the early church were a married couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. And what we see is that Ananias and Sapphira were deceptive so they could make themselves appear more generous than what they were. So have a look at uh, Acts 4 verses 34b to 37 just to set Ananias and Sapphira's actions into context. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, uh, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, 
the early church had been recipients of God's generosity towards them in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus came, died in the place of people so people could be forgiven and, and, and that was an act of extreme generosity on the part of God but also undeserved generosity because none of us deserve to have Jesus die for us. And in response to God's generosity towards them, people in the church now start to overflow with generosity. Uh, they start selling blocks of land. They start selling houses. There was no command for them to do that. This was a, a free will response to the generosity of God to them. And they sell uh, these things and give the money to the apostles so that those who were in need could be cared for. And Ananias and Sapphira decide to get in on the act. And so we read in chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, we're not sort of given any sort of figures here, but let, let's just say, for example, right, that uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they sell their block of land and they get $100,000 for it. Okay, so let's just imagine that. And, uh, and, and, and the main reason why they sell the block of land is because they want to give uh, the money to the apostles to help the needy. So that's all good. But then let's just imagine, for example, that uh, Ananias and Sapphira think, you know what, we've got all this money and, and our bathroom needs updating. Um, so maybe we'll uh, set aside $20,000 for that and, and the $80,000 we'll give to the church to help the needy. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. There was no reason why they had to give all of the money. And so anyway, they turn up to the church and, uh, you know, and, and they present the money to uh, the apostles and they say, we got $80,000 for our land. Here's $80,000. See what happened there? They actually got 100000 but they only said, we got eighty for it. And here's the full amount. So, so what they're actually doing, rather than saying, uh, we've given part of our land sale to you, they're actually making the claim, we're giving the full amount that we received for the block of land. So they're being deceptive. Now again, there was no obligation on their part to have to give the full amount. Indeed, the Apostle Peter in verse 4 addresses Ananias saying, didn't it, the land, belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not just lied to human beings, but to God. Again, Peter says, there was no obligation for you to have to give all of the proceeds from the land sale. You didn't have to do it. It was entirely up to you as to what you did with it. But by actually saying that you gave the full amount when you actually didn't give the full amount, well, you've been deceptive. Not just to people, but to God himself. That's what's going on. Now, why is it that uh, Ananias and Sapphira do this? Why do they act in this deceptive way? Well, my guess is, you know, we, we just saw at the end of uh, chapter 4, Barnabas, uh, you know, sells his land and gives it all to the church and, and, and the apostles call him a son of encouragement. You know, Barnabas is a nickname of sorts, right? And, 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 and maybe Ananias and Sapphira were thinking, well, if we only give a portion of it, maybe people won't think as highly of us as they do of the people who gave the full amount. Maybe they won't think as highly of us as the people who gave the full amount. Maybe we won't get a nice nickname like Barnabas. Okay? Friends, at the heart of all deception, I think, is a desire to be viewed by others more highly than we deserve to be. A desire to be viewed by others more highly than what we really are. That's why people are deceptive. You know the old story about fishermen, they, they catch a fish that's actually that long and they say it's, you know, that long. You know, why do they do that? Well, they want us to think that they're better fishermen than what they actually really are. Uh, we hear stories too often of uh, politicians who have not told the truth, of churches who have covered up abuses, that sort of stuff, right? 
Why do politicians and churches do that? So that we actually think that they are better than what they really are. And, and, and here's the irony of it all. The truth always comes out. And once it comes out, people then think much, much less of the politicians and the churches than they would have if the politicians and churches had just been up front in the first place. And during the week I was reading an article about uh, loneliness, how loneliness is on the increase in our society. And you know, it was interesting, social media was uh, listed as one of the reasons for loneliness. Uh, not just because of the idea that people now just kind of connect via their devices and not face to face, not that. But because on social media, people tend to present uh, a much better picture of themselves than what is actually the case. And so what actually happens is that people look at social media and go, gee, that person's really got it together. I don't know if I can really hang out with a person who's really got it together like that. I'd be a real drag for them. And, and so people are less inclined, once they see how great and amazing people are on social media, to actually engage with them for that reason. That's just a deception, right? It's a deception. We don't want people to think uh, worse of us. We want people to think more of us than what is actually the case. And brothers and sisters, as followers of Jesus, we actually have, like deception is wrong, but we actually have no reason to engage in deception because the one whose opinion matters the most has accepted us for who we are, warts and all. Our God has accepted us in the Lord Jesus. Through Jesus, we are washed clean of our sins. God accepts us. And so if God accepts us, why be deceptive to gain the acceptance of others or to be thought of more highly than others? It's, it's good to, ref, you know, if you're tempted to be deceitful, for that reason, to reflect upon the grace of God to you, the acceptance that God has given you already. Now, what we see as we look at this passage is that deception comes from Satan and is an act against God which cannot be hidden. So, Acts 5 verse 3, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you receive for the land? And then uh, in verses 7 to 9a, we read about Three hours later, Ananias' wife came in, not knowing what had happened, that is, that he died. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? There's a few things I just want to highlight from those verses. The first is, you can't hide anything from God. Can't hide anything from God. So, you know, Ananias and Sapphira, they've conspired to kind of perform this deception and no doubt they weren't announcing it publicly, yet Peter knew. You know, how did Peter know? <laughs> well, the Spirit obviously reveals to Peter what has gone on. And, and friends, to, to think you can hide something from God is to really to dishonour God because it's actually saying that we think that God is much smaller and must, much less knowledgeable than what he actually is. God knows everything. Can't hide anything from God. Notice that uh, Peter says to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have done this? Now, friends, I, I, I think that Ananias and Sapphira were, were Christian people who had God's spirit. I, I don't think the issue here is one of the, the Holy Spirit being bumped out by Satan. I think more it, it's, it, it's the issue of they were tempted. And rather than fulfilling the will of the spirit who dwelt in them, they now fulfill the will of Satan, who is the father of lies. That's what John chapter 8, verse 44 tells us. The truth of the matter, friends, is that the evil one uh, will always be seeking to tempt us to fulfill his will rather than the will of the spirit who dwells in us, whose will is revealed in the scriptures. He is always at work seeking to tempt us in those ways. And again, it will inevitably our, be our desire to be viewed more positively than we deserve to be that will cause us to succumb to such a temptation. At the end of the day, Ananias and Sapphira, as they come before the Apostle Peter, as they come before the church that the Spirit had brought into existence, weren't just lying to people, 
They were lying to the spirit who had brought that church into existence. It's a serious issue. And we see that God acts decisively. We see that God took drastic action against Ananias and Sapphira because of the danger their deceptive ways posed to the church and its mission. So in verse 5 we read, When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And in verses 9b to 10, Peter speaking to Sapphira says, Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. God puts Ananias and Sapphira to death for their deception. Now, it's quite possible that there'll be people here this morning going, gee, that's a bit extreme on God's part, isn't it? Uh, to put them to death for telling a lie. Um, you know, surely there could be more serious things to put people to death for. Surely just maybe a public humiliation might have been in order. Uh, putting them to death? Well, friends, if that's how you're thinking, can I suggest to you that one of the problems that we have as sinful human beings is that we don't really understand the awfulness of sin. We don't understand it. Uh, God, who was pure, he sees sin for the awful thing that it really is. But because we're sinful, we're kind of blinded to the reality of just how bad it is. Indeed, one of the things that happens, I think, as the longer you're a Christian and the more you grow in godliness is that you start to see just how bad you are. Increasingly, you think, gee, I don't think I'm very good. Well, the issue isn't that you're getting worse. The issue is you're becoming more aware of your sinfulness. Okay? Friends, deception is not a trivial matter. It is a serious matter. How do you feel when people lie to you? Don't like it, do you? find it hard to trust people after they've lied to you, particularly if it's over a fairly significant thing. Friends, deception destroys relationships. Uh, when it comes to a church, uh, you know, the Lord Jesus wants us to be united. If there's deception going on within our midst, it's going to be hard to be united, isn't it? Deception also destroys people's reputations. Uh, the reason why we have defamation laws is so if someone says something false about me, which could really severely damage my reputation, I can go to a court and uh, have it brought there and sue the person and so my reputation can be restored because deception causes damage to reputations as well. It's a destructive thing. And here's the thing, we're called to be on a mission to speak the truth, the truth of the gospel which is genuinely truth. If we're committed to deception, guess what? We're not going to speak the words of truth. So, friends, see how this threat is actually a very, very serious threat to this church in its infancy. Uh, this church, which is uh, one in heart and mind, could be very much undermined by this deception. This church, which is called to reach people with the truth of the gospel, could be undermined by this deception as well. That's why God acts so drastically. And notice the impact that it has on the church. Great fear emerges. Great fear. Ananias and Sapphira are an example of why deception is wrong. And God makes it very clear to them it's wrong. And so there's a strong warning to them there, isn't there? Do what God wants. Be people who speak the truth. Don't be deceptive. Don't be deceptive. Now, what we see as a result of all of this is that God's action against Ananias and Sapphira enabled the gospel to continue to spread. So verses 12 to 14, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So this threat, which could have potentially undermined the unity of the church, its effectiveness in mission, 
it was dealt with. And the very next thing that we read about after this threat has been dealt with is how the gospel continues to spread. Okay? God averts this threat and the ministry goes on as it should. Now again, friends, um, I think that the big issue here is when we see sin emerge in the life of the congregation, we need to treat it like a cancer that needs to be cut out because that's effectively what God did with Ananias and Sapphira. We need to take action against it, okay? Not to sort of uh, tolerate it and allow it to be like yeast that works its way through the dough. It needs to be dealt with. Indeed, in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, you read about a situation where a man was sleeping with his stepmother. Something the Old Testament spoke against, something the prevailing culture uh, thought was repulsive. And what does the Apostle Paul tell the Corinthians to do? Cast this man out. Hand him over to Satan until he comes to his senses and repents and then you can bring him back. When you allow sin to fester in the life of a church, it will impact upon a church's unity, it will impact upon its ability to be able to do mission and so it's got to be dealt with. The Lord Jesus certainly maps out how we are to deal with issues of sin in the life of the church. But God dealt decisively with this uh, threat of deception and the result was the gospel continued to spread. Let's now turn to the second of the threats that the early church faced and this brings me to my second main point which is that the apostles acted decisively when division emerged within the early church. And uh, the division was between the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1, we read about this. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, the first thing to note, historically speaking, is that there, were, there was a tension between a group known as the Hellenistic Jews and those who were known as the Hebraic Jews. Now, what was the difference between them? Well, the Hellenistic Jews were Greek speakers. They were Greek speakers. They probably came from areas outside of the area of Palestine, uh, spoke the Greek language and no doubt were influenced by the Greek culture. The Hebraic Jews are those who come from within the area of Palestine and speak Hebrew or Aramaic and uh, have not been so infiltrated by Greek culture as such. And as I said, there was, there was a tension between these groups, it seems. I, I think the Hebraic Jews thought the Hellenistic Jews were a bit of a sellout for the way they'd embraced uh, the kind of the Hellenistic sort of culture and the Hellenistic Jews no doubt didn't like being looked down upon by the Hebraic Jews. So that seems to be what's going on there. Now, all that tension was there before these people were converted. Uh, they've come to Christ, they're, they're part of this one church now, but a problem emerges when it comes to distributing food to those who are in need. As the church grows and grows and grows, there's a group who starts missing out. It's the widows of the Hellenistic Jews. And they make a complaint. They make a complaint. And no doubt they are perceiving that there is favouritism being shown. And let me tell you, favouritism inevitably causes division of sorts. Okay? Favouritism inevitably causes division of sorts. Now, I want to suggest to you, though, that I don't think that uh, what happened here happened because people in the church were wanting to favour one group over the other. I think what we have here is a situation where uh, the church is growing so quickly and the people, that is the apostles responsible for it, well, they're not growing in number and so their kind of ability to sort of, you know, do things, well, they're, they're really spread thin at this point. But the complaint is made and what we see is that the apostles acted quickly to put a solution in place to deal with the division. So verses 2 to 4. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together, so the, you know, how many thousand of them there are at this point, and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So it seems that the apostles are responsible for everything at this point. But as they hear this complaint, 
they acknowledge two things. First of all, they're spread too thin. So much so, they're not even doing their main job properly. Their main job is to focus on the ministry of the word and prayer. They're not actually doing that job properly. And so they acknowledge, we've got to really focus on this. But there's also the issue of feeding the poor in the church. And so the apostles acknowledge, we actually need to hand this responsibility over to someone else to take care of this. And so they propose to the larger church, how about you choose seven men? Uh, Notice, don't just choose anyone, but people who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, people who have the reputation for following the spirit's will, people who have the reputation for being wise. So choose seven men who fit that criteria and we'll hand the responsibility of helping these people with food over to them to perform, to make sure that no one misses out, to make sure that no one falls through the cracks. And then we read in verses 5 to 6, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Uh, Good idea, the church says, let's do it. They choose seven men. Now, you know what's remarkable about the seven men who have been chosen? It appears that they are all Hellenistic Jews, or in the case of Nicholas, a Hellenistic uh, convert to Judaism. They're all Hellenistic Jews. Now, I want you to just uh, think about this for a moment. Uh, Just just think about churches all around the world. Um, As churches sort of set up governing bodies and they think about appointing people to the governing bodies, you know, the the people at nine o'clock say, well, we should have someone on that uh, governing board to represent us. And uh, the people say at uh, 10.45, say, we should have someone uh, on that uh, governing board to represent us. And the people at the night church say, we should have someone to represent us. And, you know, our interests need to be looked after. So inevitably, you see that sort of thing going on, right? Notice what the Hebraic Jews do. They choose Hellenistic Jews. That's remarkable, isn't it? It's an act of what I call humility, what the Bible calls humility. It's putting the interests of others before your own, following the very example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, even though he's the great King of Kings, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Following the example of Christ, the humble example of Christ, these Hebraic Jews say, okay, well, the issue is with the Hellenistic Jewish widows. Well, we need to make sure that there are Hellenistic people on board here to actually serve them, to make sure that they are not overlooked. And brothers and sisters, I I, I think uh, here we see really one of the essential Uh, keys to being united and that is humility following the example of christ putting the interests of others before ourselves Uh, you often have disunity friends when people are clashing to achieve their rights it's my right no it's my right clash 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 right but when it's let me serve you no let me serve you (laughs) you're much more inclined to be united Okay, so what we see here is that the the apostles put forward a solution, the whole church embraces it, but then a section of the church acts with great humility to resolve any potential division. And friends, it's essential that you deal with division. Uh, Remember that uh, the Lord Jesus called upon us to love one another. Why? So that by our love we would be marked out as his disciples. Uh, Ephesians 3 talks about how it is that God unites Jew and Gentile to display his manifold wisdom to the heavenly rulers and authorities. Uh, Friends, we are meant to be coming together as a diverse group of people and being united. So as the divided world around us looks at us and goes, what is it about them? Was it about these people that they are so united and so filled with love for one another? We're meant to stand out. Well, if we're not dealing with division... And if we're divided like the rest of the world is, then why would people actually bother looking at us? 
And you know the old saying, in politics, division is death. Whenever political parties are divided, they don't fulfil their roles very well. Well, if we're divided, we're not going to fulfil our role of mission very well either. It's so important that we seek to be humble and be united as best as we can. Now, there's one exception uh, to this uh, need to pursue unity, and it's in a situation where there are people who are actively being false in teaching or being immoral, uh, blatantly living against what it is that God calls upon us to do. Uh, we can't be united with false teachers. We can't be united with those who refuse to repent and who are actively living in ways which dishonour God. Very sadly, uh, as we look at the Anglican Church, the wider Anglican Church throughout Australia and the world, more and more uh, churches around the world have embraced false teaching, have uh, endorsed living that just simply goes against what the Bible teaches. And, and those of us who hold to the Scriptures are, are desperately saddened by this because we want to be united with people, but these people are actually walking away from what God wants. And there comes a point where you have to cut the cord. That's a very, very sad thing, may I say. But the Lord Jesus prayed that we would be one. United in truth, united in love. And humility, friends, is the key to such unity. And what we see is that the Apostles' action in dealing with the division enabled the continued spread of the Gospel. So verse 7, So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So again, there was a threat that emerged that could have derailed uh, the church's unity, could have derailed its mission, but because the Apostles, no doubt, in the wisdom that God's Spirit gave them, have dealt with this issue, because the church has dealt with it in such a humble way, the Word of God continues to spread. So, brothers and sisters, the truth is we are imperfect. We are flawed because we are sinful. And it is inevitable that uh, in our sinfulness uh, that threats to our unity as a church, threats to our effectiveness in mission will emerge. What do we learn from the book of Acts? Deal with such threats decisively. Seek the wisdom of God to deal with those threats decisively. It's precisely as those threats are dealt with decisively that the church remains united and effective in its mission. So, let me now pray that we might indeed be like that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks uh, for the way in which uh, you and your apostles uh, intervened when there were threats in a decisive way to ensure that the church in Jerusalem uh, remained united and uh, was indeed effective in mission. And so, Father, now help us to be aware of such threats. Help us uh, to graciously uh, and wisely be able to deal with such threats decisively. So, Father, that uh, our unity and our effectiveness in mission is not impacted. Uh, please, Lord God, um, help us to grow in our understanding of the awfulness of sin, of uh, the awfulness of division, so that we would indeed flee uh, from such things. And we want to pray for this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.